Okay, Robert Conklin. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Conkling, and I'm a uh, tenant in the SRO building at 215 West 14th Street in the rapidly gentrifying uh, Lower Chelsea uh, and expanding meatpacking district. I've been a, a tenant in my building, in my apartment, for 29 years. And for the last approximately 10 years, uh, with Goddard Riverside Law Project, we've been fighting to uh, maintain uh, habitability uh, under three landlords and uh, to keep uh, 215 West 14th Street as part of the uh, affordable housing stock in New York City. Uh, we have a diverse building of um, uh, retirees like myself, uh, young, uh, young postgraduates who are heavily burdened with debt, artists, uh, freelancers, etc., and uh, new immigrants to the city of New York. I'm really here just to say thank you. For the last several years, uh, you have uh, passed a 0% increase in buildings like ours, and you're proposing a 0% increase this year. I cannot tell you how that has galvanized myself and my tenants to create tenants association and outreach for other SRO tenants in the building. You have encouraged us that this is a viable housing model for New York, and we intend to continue to fight. So thank you, each and every one of you. That's simply my message today. Thank you for your testimony. Anne Greenberg. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Anne Greenberg. I'm a rent stabilized senior citizen in Peter Cooper Village. I did not get the benefit of the first rent freeze. I was too afraid to let my lease expire about the same time as the rent stabilization law. I had to make sure I had a roof over my head for another year in case the state legislature didn't renew that law. So here we are again. My landlord is Blackstone. They paid a lot to buy Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village, about $5.4 billion, but they're not hurting. President of Blackstone recently celebrated his 70th birthday with a party costing over $10 million with camels and Gwen Stefani. I'll be celebrating my upcoming 70th birthday with two MCIs and another on the way. It is not the same thing. But I'm lucky. My rent consumes only about 30% of my income. Even so, I feel I'm living on the edge in the neighborhood I grew up in. So let's look at some other numbers, your numbers. Last year, landlords' costs went down, but tenants still didn't get a rollback. This year, costs are projected to go up, but for the 11th consecutive year, net operating income has gone up, far outstripping costs. I call on you to do the right thing, give the tenants a rollback or a freeze or the least possible increase. Help us stay in our homes, age in place, continue to contribute to our communities and the city. And when you take the final vote on June 27th, I'd like to hear every public member explain and defend his or her vote. The public and tenants are the public, should know just how the public members are serving them. And I don't want to take a moment to refute that uh, landlord notion that you can't raise a preferential rent, because our landlord has found a great way to do it, the same way the uh, lady from St. Mark's Place referred to. They slice and dice the apartments. They basically create dorm apartments, or we, I would consider them glorified SROs. A one bedroom becomes a two, a two becomes a three. So instead of having a place you rent with for one, you know, one income or two incomes, now you have three incomes. You can just keep raising the rent, and then you find three people whose incomes are higher, and no problem with raising those preferential rents. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Susan Steinberg. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I had prepared a statement, but I decided I'm going to leave it with the desk uh, so you can have copies because I wanted to respond to a couple of points that Jack Freund, I think it's Jack Freund, of the rent stabilization 
association made because frankly they irked me. And one is that MCIs were really laughable in terms of income for uh, landlords. Well, perhaps he forgot something, which is that uh, MCIs get onto a uh, tenant's rent in perpetuity. We, it goes way beyond recouping the landlord's cost. And if you're a tenant and you live in a building that has received several, as ha is happening in Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village, and it gets added permanently to your legal rent, and then the RGB increases get on top of that, that starts to add up really fast. So maybe it's laughable in terms of the landlord, but as sure as hell isn't for the tenant. That's number one. And then in terms of preferential rents, um, back in t around 2013, when CW Capital, the special servicer, uh, effectively owned uh, Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village, they initiated Midtown, uh, Midtown, <laughs> Midlease rent increases for people with preferential rents, and those rents suddenly went up hundreds and thousands of dollars, and 1,300 people had to move. Uh, in a very short amount of time. Preferential rents can go up a great deal more than just 5%. The Tenants Association gets called a lot by tenants who have a preferential rent. They didn't really understand it. They have a rider in their lease, and they call up and say, my rent just went up $50 a month, $100 a month, $200 a month. What happened to the rent guidelines board increases? And we have to educate them about preferential rents. So I just wanted to make my comments known. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Do oh, you have a question? I, yeah. Can you tell us how much you paid in increases in just MCI loans in the last five years? Um, it's it's well. Let's see. There were hot water heaters. There were uh, facades. Um, there were video intercoms. Uh, some apartments are now getting ramps. I, I haven't sat down to work it out, but uh, these costs are anywhere from, some of them are kind of minimal. They could be $1.56 a room, but some of them are more like uh, $5, $10, $13. And when you have several of them added on, it gets to be a burden. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm sorry, I have a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, could you just explain uh, the, I guess I'm just unfamiliar with it, the um, mid-lease uh, increase in rent? How does that work? Uh, it only happened en masse one time when CW Capital, the special servicer, owned Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village. The rent, uh, when the um, lease rider actually states that the landlord is, if you have a preferential rent, the landlord is allowed to raise it at any time up at, and up to the legal rent. So if you're a tenant who has been given a rent that, let's say, uh, you know, they, the landlords know the market will not bear, for example, $4,000 for a one-bedroom apartment, and you walk in as a tenant, and they say, we're going to give you a deal. We'll make it $3,200. you are like, oh, this is really great. And you have no idea that under the law, the landlord can turn around and say, well, we've had second thoughts about this. And so on lease renewal, you get to pay um, another $500, or maybe even in between your lease, it's allowed. So, so I, I just want to understand this in between the lease um, aspect because I understand how it works when your lease is renewed that they can raise up to the legal maximum rent. But uh, what kind of term would be contained in a lease that would allow them to raise the rent during the term of the lease? Um, I think it's actually in the lease rider. They, they, are, they are allowed to raise it at any time. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> The next uh, three speakers will be Keith Powers, Marietta Hawks, and Charles Anderson. Hello, thank you. My name is Keith Powers, and I'm here with my neighbors from Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village. Uh, I'm a board member of the of the Tenants Association there. I'm also appearing as a city I'm appearing on my own as a city council candidate to represent myself, my family, and thousands of my neighbors who are concerned about the increased cost of living in New York City. Uh, since you've already heard from some of my neighbors, I'll keep it short and brief. But uh, I'm here to ask the Rent Guidelines Board today to hold firm on a rent freeze and a zero percent increase, and to provide rent regulated tenants. With 
with continued to relief from the cost of living in New York City. Uh, like many others who are here, I was born and raised in Peter Cooper Village in Stuyvesant Town. Uh, I've spent my life there. I was born in a good rent regulated apartment. Uh, this is a neighborhood that's defined by families, affordability, and the feel of a close-knit neighborhood in the middle of a dense city. My grandparents moved there as original tenants. My father lived there. My, me and my sister have had the opportunity to grow our lives there as well. Uh, and all of this was due to having a good rent stabilized apartment. Uh, I want to make sure that we, I continue to provide that for my family and my neighbors as well. Um, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, if you look at some of the statistics that the, the board and others have put out, uh, the growth in landlords' net operating income has seen decent growth, even in years of very low rent increases, like the 10.8% increase in landlord income after the 1% increase in 2014. In the past few years, with the board setting the guideline at 0%, landlord net operating income has continued to remain strong and steady. Thanks to the Rent Guideline Board's focus on improving the condition of low-income New Yorkers uh, uh, with little to no rent increases, we have seen both the median rent burden and, uh, and the median residual income per capita of low-income New Yorker renters go up. This is all according to the uh, Community Service Society. The city is finally reaching a point, in my, belief, in my view, that uh, where we are recovering from the recession from a few years ago, and to incre increase rents now would be to severely handicap the improvement in the lives of low- and middle-income New Yorkers. I recognize that uh, small residential buildings and large property owners alike have cost challenges, but I don't think we can leave tenants at risk of being priced out of their apartment through continued increases. Uh, I urge the board to have no rent increase again this year. Thank you for your time today, and I thank you for my neighbors and others for being here for your time as well. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, can, I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, so tell us what you've seen just in Peter Cooper Stuyvesant in town in the last 15 years yeah. uh, in relationship to a fully stabilized development to what you've seen, and how has that affected the community yeah. and the affordability there? Well, I can tell you right now, being out there in the community and talking to people, these rent increases have a real uh, a real impact on the pocketbooks of people. And we look at them in sort of percentages and the dollar amount, but when you put it over multiple years, you put it uh, uh, into people who are retired, do not have a steady income in some cases, uh, I think it becomes a real challenge. I also think it's, it's challenging people who have lived here for a very a long time about to make decisions about whether they're going to stay or they're going to go. I think uh, uh, having the zero percent increase over the last few years has has been really meaningful. You can you can feel it. I mean, when I talk to people, you can really feel like the, the sort of the th the pages have turned, and we're having policies that actually help working families in New York City. Um, to your point earlier, I would say the SCREE program has been a wonderful asset to a lot of folks. I hear from people in Stuyvesant Town about increasing the both the income threshold, but also uh, particularly expanding it beyond uh, tenants who are not currently covered by it, former Michelama apartments as an example. So I think there is ways that SCREE could be a continued use of tenants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marietta Hawks. If I could only see. <laughs> I would like to thank you, board, for listening to my testimony today. My name is Marietta Hawks. And I re represent the seniors in Stytown who are disabled and, and too frail to come here today. And also for the families and the single people whose rent has increased with MCIs. And it's really unfair. Forever we're paying for an MCI. We pay for a facade, a water tower, intercom. It's just unfair. Some apartments even range 5000 a month, which is crazy. Well, my story is, I have two brothers that are now deceased. I live alone. I have no husband, no children. I pay more than 45% of my income to rent. Even though I'm on scree, it's still very high. I've lived here for 40 years, and I've seen a lot. Under MetLife, it was great. But when Tishman Spire took over, their goal was to get the rent-stabilized people out. Uh, one year we had five MCIs. And my expenses, wow. I have uh, two senior cats. I have to worry about paying for their vet bills. Uh, I can't go to physical therapy because of the co-pays. 
I don't have internet, I don't have cable, I don't have air conditioning, and I'm suffering from breathing problems. I have to sleep in a recliner now. I just dread the summer. And then if I was to get air conditioning, I'd have to pay for rewiring. It would be $50 a month, and I just couldn't afford it. I go to the community lounge. I go to the senior centers just to be in air conditioning like we are today. <laughs> And then I have friends that are also suffering. I have uh, two friends, one's 87, she lives in Queens, she still is working in Baruch, and she has a difficulty paying the rent. My other friend, Rhoda, she's also in Queens, and she's helping support her son, very intelligent fellow, he's on Section 8, so she pays his medical bills, transportation to and from the doctors. And then I also met this, um, fellow named Larry at the Siege, Sage Senior Center, and he's being harassed in the Bronx. And he said, who can I go to? I, re I recommended him to Gail Brewer, because she helps a lot of people with housing problems. And I also, we have a very strong tenants association, and thanks to Susan Steinberg, she's a gem. We'd be lost without her. And also, <laughs> Also, Dan Garodnik, he grew up in Stytown. He's helped us on numerous occasions. We had a lot of gallop notices. They were trying to get us tenants out for non-residency. I had a friend, Rosie, she lived in Peter Cooper. She lost her apartment. Uh, she was in housing you, court 10 years. Your time is up. Could you wind up your presentation, Yes, please? I would just like the board to have some love for the tenants, have some compassion. Just, you know, we, we're really struggling, and the you know, the landlords they're making on the MCIs, we have vacancy, you, have, you know, they remodelize the apartments, then they go fair market. You know, just to have some love, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, the next speakers are Charles Anderson, Ann Cunningham, and Eli Strauss. That. Hi, good afternoon. Good My afternoon. name is Charles Anderson, and I am speaking here today on behalf of Assembly Member uh, Deborah Gleck, who is in Albany on state business. It's still session. Um, so, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to testify before you today. The Assembly Member represents District 66 in Manhattan, which is the neighborhoods of Tribeca, Soho, Greenwich Village, the East Village, uh, and Far West Village. Uh, but, she's, but I'm here today on behalf of all rent regulated tenants in New York many of whom make difficult choices every day between keeping food on the table and paying an ever-increasing rent. Uh, I think the, rent, the board for the unprecedented rent freeze instituted in 2015 and continued last year in 2016 and urge you again to implement a rent freeze for all rent-regulated tenant, rent tenants. It is clear that New York City is experiencing a widespread housing crisis amidst a prolific boom in construction. While some may argue that efforts by the mayor to create affordable housing will effectively bridge these gaps in affordability, everyday New Yorkers in the meantime continue to struggle to find and maintain affordable housing, especially within certain communities. And constituents regularly reach out to our office to express concern and frustration over rising rents and harassment from landlords who are challenging their residency and illegally trying to terminate leases. There simply aren't enough affordable housing units to meet the growing demand. And despite the fact that newly constructed units are being added to the market, it seems that for every rent stabilized unit that is added, some are lost. According to NYU's Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy, 64% of New York City residents are renters. Despite recent increases in median, median income for all New Yorkers, the Furman Center reports that wages have not returned to pre-recession levels while rents have continued to increase unabated. In fact, between 2005 and 2015, Manhattan experienced the highest increase in median gross rent on an average of 27.9%. The neighborhoods within District 66 are some of the most expensive in the United States and have likely experienced an even greater increase in median gross rent. Uh, uh, furthermore, landlords continue to use tools like MCIs uh, to freak and are frequently are the, ba are the basic upgrades for building-wide services that landlords should want to extend to tenants regardless of rent-regulated status. I'll wrap up. I would like to thank the Rent Guidelines Board for the progress made during the unprecedented rent freeze over the last two years. However, I strongly urge uh, you to freeze rents again this year to give our New York City communities a chance to continue to catch up 
with, uh, and exist without unjust rent increases for, that residents cannot afford. Thank you. Thank you. Ann Cunningham. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Rent Guideline Board, and all those present. My name is Ann Cunningham, and I have been a resident, a hotel resident, for over 35 years, and have testified before the Rent Guidelines Board during my whole tenancy. Today, I am testifying on behalf of the Temple Hotel tenants. The Temple Hotel, formerly the Commander Hotel, is now owned by AIMCO and has been downsized to 201 total units, of which only 63 are occupied by statutory permanent rent-stabilized hotel tenants. Many of the tenants tenants are elderly, disabled, unemployed, and low income. Twenty years ago, Harriet and Steve Croman were hired as managing agents of the, hotel, of the commander by the landlord. The same Mr. Croman, who recently made news and will be serving jail time for harassment and fraud of tenants. In their one year as managing agents, Croman displaced over half the tenants in my building with hopes of filling the rooms with market rate tenants and with the apparent intent to purchase the building. However, the owner then refused to sell the hotel to them, after which the Cromans then left. The building has never had full occupancy of rent-stabilized tenants since that time. And units have been rented to tourists, college students, or just kept empty. In two 2015, AIMCO applied for a certificate of non-harassment from the New York City HPD in order to get construction permits to change the certificate of occupancy. That's what they wanted to do. AIMCO was denied the certificate of non-harassment due to evidence of harassment in the preceding three years. They do plan to apply for a certificate of non-harassment again in 2018. Tenants in my building have been through so much over the years, but we have endured. Thank you for your considering the plight of New York City's remaining residential hotel and SRO tenants, and for not voting to approve an unwarranted rent increase, which prevents further homelessness. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Eli Strauss. That's fine. Hi, my name is Eli Strauss. I'm here on behalf of State Senator Brad Hoylman, who represents the State Senate's 27th District, which includes Clinton and Hell's Kitchen, the southern portion of the Upper West Side, Chelsea, Greenwich Village, Midtown, portions of East Midtown, the East Village, and the Lower East Side. The mixed income district comprises many of the iconic rental complexes in the city, including Stytown and Peter Cooper, London Terrace Gardens, West Beth, Phipps Plaza, a number of others. Um, the rent freeze offered for the last two years on one-year leases was a necessary respite from the constant financial anxiety experienced by hardworking New Yorkers. As you know, many advocates are pushing for a third rent freeze or even a rollback this year. 
I join them in this request, not only because the data supports our position, but because New York City is deep into an existential affordability crisis, and it is the proper role of government to be a bulwark against homelessness, displacement, and further economic segregation. Given this reality, I was disappointed and frustrated to learn that the board has suggested rent increases ranging from 1% to 3% for one-year leases and 2 to 4% for two-year leases. A lot has been written this year about how the data justifies a rent increase, but respectfully, I say that that is only possible if one ignores all data other than the price index of operating costs made available by the RGB's excellent research staff. The numbers tell us, as many have cited, that for the 11th straight year, net operating income grew, and again, as many have said, by a remarkable 10.8%. If your costs are going up by 6.2% and your net operating income is maintained at 10.8%, you do not need to be saved or maintained by government. The people whose hard-earned paychecks are supplying your 10.8% are the ones who need our help. It is also time to do more than tinker around the edges of percentiles and instead to have a real discussion about the purpose of rent regulation and what it means about who we believe deserves to call... Hmm. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm going to claim back those seconds. Okay. Um, and uh, the, about the purpose of rent regulation and what it means about who we believe deserves to call New York City home. Since 1994, New York City has lost a net 151,899 rent-stabilized apartments, which is a staggering number. In 2016, the single largest share of responsibility for the loss of stabilized units was high rent or vacancy deregulation. If each stabilized apartment we lost housed only one person, and they surely housed more than one on average, then it would be as though since 1994, we had kicked out 22% of the population of Boston. Boston. It is impossible to overstate how corrosive this is to the character of a city that was built for and by working people. We need artists and iron workers living alongside lawyers and doctors for our city to maintain its fundamental ethos, and this is simply not possible if we fear a slightly smaller paycheck for landlords more than we fear homelessness and segregation. I understand that the preliminary vote has set the range for increases, and I dispute respectfully the assertion that those ranges are binding. It does not say they are binding in the statute. Therefore, I am appealing to you all... Excuse me, your time is up. Could you wrap up your presentation, please? Yes, I'm on the last paragraph. I'm appealing to all of you who care enough about New York City to spend your time on a project as admittedly thankless as this one to do the right thing and institute a continuation of rent freezes and to extend it to two-year leases as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, what um, State Senator Holman or others are doing in Albany with respect to vacancy uh, allowances, et cetera? And there are so many things that we hear about in these yeah. hearings are determined totally by state law. Yeah. The Rent Guidelines Board has no authority Correct. over MCIs, vacancy, preferential rents. Etc. Yes, ma'am. You are caught in bad crosshairs on that one. Um, yeah, so the senator supports uh, making MCIs um, only the length of the cost required to recoup the outlay. Um, he also supports tying scree injury to inflation so that they rise with inflation every year. The income limits rise with inflation every year. That seems rational and fair. Um, and uh, as for at the moment, they're just, you know, they're slogging through the last, I think, five session days. So uh, do you mean at the moment or more broadly? I'm sorry? Did you mean at the, like at this very moment as session winds up or more broadly about his legislative priorities? I'm sorry, I can't understand you. You asked what he was doing in Albany. I I'm asking if you mean no, his... I really meant with respect what was going on in terms of relief from some of these situations coming from Albany. Yes, so he supports MCIs being limited to the amount required to recoup costs, same for individual apartment improvements. He supports eliminating the vacancy bonus. Um, and I said about the scree inflation. Is that, is that yeah, all that's your questions? Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. I also, I think there's a package of 13 pieces of legislation that the senator signed on to. Yes, it's a... Preferentials for the life of the tenancy, Correct. issues around vacancy. So there's this whole package that I know the senator signed on to all those bills Correct. that haven't passed in Albany last year nor this year. No, and you know, the Senate being what it is, we are hopeful but skeptical. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
are they going to try to do it? Because I'll make an announcement. Uh, we're taking just a brief pause to see what we can do about the lighting situation. Just a second. I thought you said it was okay. Should I get them? We're seeing if we can increase the lighting. Well. <laughs> yeah, the lights may go out temporarily, but the hope is for improvement in the lighting. Something happened that was better. That was better, whatever they yeah. had. Oh, there we go. That's good, I think. No, no, it's brighter. It's brighter. I think that. Where it was before. Go back up. Go back up. That's good. No, no, no. no. This is a game. That's yes. good, right there. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. The next speakers are Jonathan Furlong, Barry Shapiro, and Denise Freiberg. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jonathan Furlong. I'm the Director of Organizing at Housing Conservation Coordinators. Uh, we're a not-for-profit that seeks to preserve safe, decent, and affordable housing on the west side of Manhattan. I'm testifying today because tenants in Hell's Kitchen and all over New York City are facing the same displacement pressures they have been for years. Rents have increased dramatically while wages have remained stagnant. To borrow a quote from the Furman Center's most recent report on poverty, quote, the pressures of rising housing costs are greatest on those with the fewest resources, people living in poverty. New York City has a larger number of people living in poverty today than it has since at least 1970. The percentage of both severely rent burdened households and low income severely rent burdened households has remained constant over a five year period at 20.9% and 44.3% respectively. HCC works with many tents who are struggling to remain in their apartments in neighborhoods that are no longer affordable to anyone who is not wealthy. These, are tenants, these tenants are artists, teachers, social workers, seniors, immigrants, and members of the LGBTQ community. They have contributed enormously uh, to their neighborhoods, but tenants on the Upper West Side, Hell's Kitchen, and Chelsea face uh, tremendous pressures. Predatory LLCs, private equity firms are buying buildings far beyond what the current rent roll can sustain, creating an incentive to get lower paying tenants out. Landlords are getting more creative in their methods of harassment with more and more turning the buildings into unsafe construction sites. One tenant that I met with this week, actually on Monday, had her staircases removed and was told to use the fire escape as the means of egress. All too often, when this harassment is successful, rent-stabilized tenants are converted into condominiums and are in turn often rented as to tourists on Airbnb. And this Hell's Kitchen has been an epicenter for this problem since 2006, which makes long-term tenants feel unsafe. I'm here to urge this board to approve a rent rollback, or at the very, very least a rent, uh, rent freeze. This is the only meaningful action that would allow most, the most vulnerable populations in New York City uh, to remain in their homes. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a question. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing around predatory equity in the, in the area that you work? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's it's this it's different players using slightly different methods, but it's really the same you know the, the same narrative. So it's like you know uh, 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 there was a tenant that spoke about the you know the Toledano portfolio, and that was you know that's just sort of you know somebody buys a building or buys you know uh, a set of buildings, you know the the loan uh, amount. Um, you know, the, what they're paying basically to, to pay off the loan is basically you know, not enough to, um, doesn't leave them enough. It leaves them about 83 cents on the dollar to be able to maintain and, and upkeep their buildings. When that loan fails, somebody else takes it over and so on and so on and so on. I think to the, you know, the, the financial means are, and, and the financial uh, sort of practices are essentially the same. I think the players are just somewhat different. And, uh, you know, somebody else will take over a bad loan, run it into the ground, somebody else will take that loan over. Um, I think the methods, again, uh, you know, what I, what I really said about um, 
um, some of the more egregious landlords turning their apartments into construction zones, that's, that's something you know, that's, that's new, that's taken place over the past couple of years. And so that's, that's been a real difficulty for tenants, particularly on the west side uh, and, and really uh, all over the city. And John, can you tell us what rent increases would mean to the tenants you're dealing with if we did not do a rent freeze or rollback this year? For our, I think for our tenants and for our tenant leaders, uh, particularly in, in Hell's Kit and Chelsea, that would, it would be devastating. I mean, we, we run a, a housing clinic uh, twice a week, and that clinic is repeatedly either at capacity or over capacity for folks trying to remain at all costs in their homes. And these are, these are seniors, these are disabled folks, these are just very, very vulnerable populations, and even, you know, even a, a very sort of base level rent increase uh, would, would be devastating for our, for our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Barry Shapiro. Hi. Um, Barry Shapiro. I'm a 40-year uh, resident of Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village. Uh, I'm very tempted to comment about um, preferential rents and yes some of the other comments that have been made about uh, uh, capital expenses and so forth, but I want to stick to the point of whether or not there's a business justification for raising um, the rents uh, on tenants. And uh, so I just want to take a look at the increases that have occurred over the past 11 years, two on one-year uh, uh, leases. Two and three quarter percent, three percent, four percent, three percent, two and a quarter, three and three quarters, two, four, one, before we reach the two zeros. So that means that up until two years ago, the raises were three percent on average, quite substantial. And um, it also means that my rent over the past 11 years has gone up something like 26%, also uh, quite substantial. Now, when I used to be a part of the Tenant Association, um, we used to use one gauge for whether or not the rent should be raised. It was the cost of heating oil, all right? Well, the cost of heating oil from last year has gone up. But if you go to 2014 to 2015, it's gone down. And from 2013 to 14, it's gone down even more. So when you take a look at this from some kind of historical perspective, the landlord's costs with respect to heating oil, bigger picture since 2000, well actually since 2007, they've gone down. So what possibly would be the reason for raising the rent, all right? Now you can take other things into consideration, but uh, like inflation, but if you take residential costs and energy out of inflation, then you have an inflation rate of something like a half a percent. So there's no business justification for this uh, uh, raise. And that's what I have to say about that. Right? Oh, and also, um, I'm a candidate for uh, city council, too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm surprised everybody in this room isn't a <laughs> candidate the way things have been going. Thank you. Denise Freiberg. Thanks very much for allowing me to speak today. My name is Denise <coughs> Freiberg. I'm a rent stabilized tenant in my current apartment since 1992. For the majority of the time, having repairs completed has been a battle, serious enough in some cases to have the Department of Housing intervene. Conversations with the building owner typically descend into subtle and not so subtle attempts at bullying, 
and false accusations. Visiting family members sometimes feel harassed. Leases have been withheld. And there is a general all-out attempt to discourage me from living in my home. I realize that my apartment can be rolled over and the base rent can be continually increased. There is enormous turnover in my building as the majority of tenants are young professionals and not retired people like myself. Still, I am not discouraged in any way. In fact, these issues have encouraged me to educate myself regarding my rights as a tenant and to, and to stand firm along with other tenants that face similar treatment. My story is too common and that is wrong. As a retired New York City teacher of special education, I have served the most at-risk students for close to 30 years. Unlike those who can pay extravagant rents or qualify for low-income housing, people like me need, need an affordable place to call home, and my rent-stabilized apartment has been one such place. I come here today to ask you to consider voting for the lowest possible of all rent increases, and better yet, roll them back to compensate for unwarranted increases that have been made in the very recent past. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Councilperson Ben Carlos. Good afternoon, I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. For those of you online, that's at Ben Kalos on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. <laughs> I just wanna thank the Rent Guidelines uh, Board, uh, Chair and Honorable Kathleen Roberts, public members, uh, Josa, Reese, and Schaub, owner members, uh, Serafay and Walsh, and tenant members, Epstein and Garcia. <clears throat> we, we've known each other, it's my fourth year back here again and I'm again calling for a rent rollback. I want to thank the Rent Guidelines Board for two, well sorry, three amazing years. First, the lowest ever increase, followed by two historic rent freezes and so I'm just here to call upon you to do something you're now used to doing which is making history once again with a rent rollback. I also want to take a moment and just say thank you for uh, holding more accessible hearings and the second hearing in northern Manhattan, which I hope to join you in with separate testimony. Uh, as you well know and in information I've presented before, over, uh, when I compared the 20 years of RGB increases to the consumer price index, found that uh, the rent increases had outpaced the CPI by about 14%. Uh, and uh, so at this point, we're still just looking to uh, get that equity. We can either keep doing these rent freezes over and over and over again until the CPI finally catches up, or we could do a rent rollback. Uh, now, one thing that's important is that your rent burden if you're over 30% of your income, but the rent stabilized tenants, their rent to income ratio is uh, 36.4%. So even with the rent stabilized units, our tenants are still uh, rent burdened. And uh, I think the key thing being that we've lost so many rent stabilized apartments and as these apartments, every time you, you vote to increase it, uh, that re raises the apartment's rent and the opportunity for uh, decontrol, which we can't afford, especially with 60,000 homeless folks, which are a lot of folks being forced from affordable housing. I'm happy to take any questions, but I do want to thank you for your service and everything you've done so far. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> no? Nope. Well, I guess yes. Thank you for testifying. So we've heard a lot from owners saying that what a rent freeze would do or a rent rollback would do to them. How do you, how do you balance that out against the needs of the tenants you're talking about? And what do you think our role is to in considering these factors? Uh, thank you for the question uh, regarding the owners. And I think we do want to make sure that owners are able to maintain their properties in the city. Uh, we heard some numerous tenants already about the fact that they may run into challenges getting repairs. Ultimately, I think one of the concerns we see in the council is repairs being used to harass tenants, which is something we hope to nip in the bud very shortly. Uh, but that being said, uh, 
and it's hard for me to be on the question, qu being questioned side of things, but I, as I understand the Rank Guidelines Board does have a relief valve which I believe is constitutionally required so that if anyone can't afford the rent freeze, any of the owners that have been here today, they can simply transparently share their books with you, show that it's a hardship, and uh, have relief from that rent freeze or rent rollback. And so I guess the question back to the RGB or if there's any staff here is, has anyone availed themselves of that process over the previous two rent freezes? It, it goes to HCR is the one who, who oversees yeah. that? And I think we heard one in the last five years, I think. One, one applied last year, I think one in the last five years. And do we know if the one last year was successful? Yeah, it's still processing. So I, I think it would just be a situation where I think uh, you can in good conscience continue to go with rent freezes and rollbacks until that HCR number is more than one or two. Uh, and uh, again, if anyone, if you're worried about anyone, I think just making sure you advise them of the HCR process is the best thing we can do. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> the next three speakers are Irving Lee, Josmar Rojas, and Hal Brill. How you doing? Good, Good afternoon. Day. My name is Good Irving. afternoon. My name is Irving Lee. I am a Chinatown property owner, a long-time property owner. And I urge uh, the RGB to um, uh, have increases uh, in, in rents because of the fact that it's critical for, uh, especially Chinatown property owners, to preserve uh, Chinatown. And um, uh, my building happens to be 100 years old. And because of the uh, and eight residential apartments, and because of the fact that they're all rent, sta uh, rent stabilized, and I'm proud to have them rent stabilized. That's not the problem. You know, I, I'm hearing all this uh, conversation about uh, about the tenants being harassed. That's, that's so foreign to me. I feel like I'm on a different planet over here. <laughs> I never had, I don't have any of those type of issues in my situation. All of my tenants have been there for many, many years, um, uh, and uh, I had no issues with uh, any of them. Uh, one is a Section 8, and the other, I have two of them that are scree. So I have very good relations with them. But uh, my building is very old, and it re requires uh, major improvements, <laughs> capital improvements. Um, some of them don't fall into the uh, MCIs, but uh, there, there are a lot of things that have to be done in the building because of its age. Um, and many uh, property owners like myself are in that same situation, especially in Chinatown, where many buildings are very old. And I think if we, if we have the necessary... Uh, 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 increases or subsidies for that matter, it would preserve Chinatown as a community because it's the Chinatown property owners that preserve Chinatown as a community. Um, it should be pointed out that when I do major renovations, uh, the licensed contractors that I use don't give me a discount because I have uh, tenants that are rent stabilized. I have to pay the hourly rate. So that has to be taken into consideration. Um, so that's basically it. I think uh, as a Chinatown property owner, um, I don't have these issues with the tenants. And uh, I think it's very important to have these increases to preserve Chinatown the way it is. And uh, urge you to have the necessary increases and to uh, maintain affordable housing. Because it is us in, in Chinatown, the property owners that are there to maintain property, to, to maintain affordable housing. Without, the, without these benefits, we can't maintain the, um, the affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have a question. Oh, there are several questions, I believe. Sure. Uh, I, you, you had mentioned that um, you're doing lots of major capital improvements and that uh, many are MCIs. What kinds of capital improvements are you doing that, that you're not uh, able to apply for an MCI? Well, the, in, in the, uh, especially in my uh, cell area, that's not considered, it's, the beam itself that I had to replace had to be an, M, it's an MCI. But other aspects of the building, the electrical, um, the, uh, the beams, the, uh, the joists in the building have to be replaced. Uh, not everything that's under MCI uh, jurisdiction. Okay, thank you. The common areas, I believe, are under my uh, uh, accountability. The electricals that were done in the apartments uh, were MCI'd uh, in the process of being MCI'd. So there are certain variables that are in play that determine whether or not 
it's MCAD or not. But the expenses have to be done. These are very, very old buildings. Could, could you give a, a rough estimate of, um, of, of your entire MCI budget? What percentage were you able to apply for of your entire capital improvement budget? What percentage were MCI eligible? Oh, I would say a quarter. Only a quarter were yeah. MCI eligible? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's it? Okay. We have another question. If you could step back, please. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah. If you could just clarify again, so you have eight units, all rent stabilized. Yes. Three are on subsidies. Yes. Um, and could you just tell us what increase would you need to to make the economics of your building work? Oh, well, I mean, it's, it's roughly the f uh, like a four percent uh, for one year and eight percent for two years, ideally. Um, there are a lot of pressures in the community. If, if you walk through Chinatown, there is a, there's gentrification going on. And that's the reality. But the fact is, to maintain the buildings with the community existing, you have to, you have to pay for it. I mean, there's no free labor. That's the reality. Um, and you have to have contract uh, certified labor to do the work properly. And those are the variables that we have to deal with. And in order to preserve those, the, the buildings, and these are very old buildings in Chinatown, um, it does require capital and, and constant uh, operational costs. Even though it's a small unit, it's a small building, that's a reality I have to deal with. Sorry, just a quick question to clarify some of the <laughs> statements. One more question, or sure. at least one more. So uh, does your expenses exceed your income in the building? The initial cost, the capital uh, cost, are, it does. Uh, it does uh, it does exceed the uh, and does and there's constant maintenance that have to be done in order to um, to maintain the, prop the building properly up to code. <clears throat> so so your income. Oh, sorry. At, at the last few years, it, it, the uh, expenses do uh, uh, override the uh, the actual income. Even with the MCI increases. Even with the name? MCIs, yeah. And did you it's, apply for a hardship? No, I did not apply for a hardship, um, but. You know, I think it's, it's a necessary variable to have to deal with in order to, ma to, to maintain the housing, to maintain the community. Uh, interestingly enough, many of the rent sub subsidized housing that, that, that are in the area, uh, my family used to live in many, many years ago, during <coughs> the 50s and 60s. So when we did get the property during the early 70s, we, we, we maintained, we tried to maintain and develop and, uh, and to build the housing as much as possible and to maintain the community. And can I ask you more specifically about the MCIs? You said that only a quarter of the work you've done has been, you've been able to get an MCI for? Well, in the process, yes. I'm trying to get the, uh, I'm trying to get the necessary paperwork uh. done. Because there's a lot more paperwork now in terms of uh, carrying out the right. MCIs, in terms of procedures. So as far as, like, you've only been, uh, you've only been giving 25% of the work that you've done, this is, this but you've applied for more than that. No. It's only, I only could apply for MCI for those that, that qualify for MCI work. No, not, all cap, not all uh, projects qualify for MCI work. So you're just saying general maintenance of the building that's not MCI eligible. Right. It's, it's always there. That you still have to do the maintenance of the building, but Absolutely. you can't apply for MCIs for that work. Right. Have you ever applied for uh, a program through HPD to help carry the cost of a, doing an MCI, get a loan program, get a grant program from HPD? Not at the moment, no. I haven't. Uh, is there a reason why not apply to the government agencies because they have low interest grant loans and, and grant programs available for small property owners? Uh, because basically uh, it's out of my pocket. I've done that out of my pocket uh, for the most part. So have you chosen to do that instead of get a, a government subsidized loan? Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, a very, it's something that I may consider in the future, but uh, it's basically out of my pocket. Um, I've worked, I've, 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 I'm not just a landlord, I'm, I was a transit worker too at mm. one time, so I divided my income from as a, as, a, as a union transit worker. Sure. And do you think all owners are similarly situated? Do you, as an eight unit building, as someone who has 2,000 units, are you guys in a similar situation? I think the, I, well in Chinatown there are a lot of family owned operations. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are owned by um, um, associations of various mm. sorts especially in Chinatown. So it varies, um, but that, that surge of ownership occurred during the last maybe 30, 40 years during the suburbanization process, I guess, but, so but many family owners. So there's family owned businesses like yours where there's eight units and there's some maybe Commercial. in Chinatown or around the city since we have to deal with the rent guidelines for the entire city that may have different economic situations because they own a lot more units than you do. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, but you know, mine's just a family-owned business. Yours is just a small, you're a small property owner. Right. And so you might be situated differently, and we need to think about that. Yes, I understand. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank I'm you. sorry, one, one more question. Uh, yeah. Does your building have any commercial units? Yes, it does. Okay, but your, you, but your, your, your revenues for the building actually are, are less than your expenses for the building, including the commercial rent? The expenditures uh, over the last couple of years exceed the, um, the revenue. Uh, of both the commercial because, and the residential? Yeah. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, because, because of the capital improvements that have to be done, um, primarily the infrastructure. Okay. But Chinatown has those problems um, because of the age of the, of the buildings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine Rojas. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Josma Rojas. I'm a resident of Inwood, Manhattan. Um, I'm also a member of Northern Manhattan Not For Sale. I, have, I am here to give my testimony as a resident who have been subjected to ruthless tactics used by landlords to evict tenants so that they can raise rent and, um, to a ridiculous amount unaffordable by the residents of the area. This is something we are seeing all around uh, New York City. It is destroying neighborhoods and displacing families. I believe that it is our right to have affordable rent in decent neighborhoods. Our families are being displaced away from areas where they have lived and worked from, have worked from for decades. We know that Manhattan is not for sale. We are trying to fight rezoning in these same neighborhoods, which is only accelerating the process of displacing families. Just because we are not rich does not mean we should be pushed, uh, pushed out of the areas where we grew up and grew roots. It is shameful to see how all of a sudden, how all of a sudden buildings are being repaired, being repaired now that landlords want to attract higher paying tenants. I understand that we live in a capitalist society, but things like shelter should not be protect, um, should be protected from ruthless and greedy landlords. So please, do what's right for the residents of New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Hal Brill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm a small property owner. And I feel the inadequate uh, guideline increases have created long-term rentals with uh, rents too low to cover costs. Owners' costs always seem to rise. Real estate taxes, water rates always increase. I believe that the real estate taxes and water rates, they need to be decreased or rolled back. We've always experienced suppliers and supplies price increases as well as subcontractor and contractor increases. Regulation increases, the real estate business has always been regulated and increasingly so. So the cost of complying with all the re regulations have increased too. I think the RGB has failed in its mission. They have provided inadequate rent increases for way too long, for many decades, which have resulted in all long-term tenants having the lowest rents of all tenants. Well below subsistence levels, multi-generation apartments are all too common, all with the lowest rents. I think this progressive agenda of no rent increases or minute ones is very, very wrong. These low rents should have significant supplemental increases for long-term tenants with rents under $900. In addition, the highest guideline increases should be enacted. This uh, system is skewed against all lawn lords, particularly the uh, small ones. The rent guidelines board has failed the small landlord. It allows only minuscule increases that have not kept up with inflation and in fact falls further behind every year. Clearly, the situation cannot be rectified this year or overnight, but incremental steps need to be taken immediately. Raise the guideline increases, reinstitute a vacancy allowance so apartment rents can rise to subsistence levels and provide for minimum increases of the lowest rents. I think a 25, a 20 or 25% vacancy allowance for existing rent stabilized apartments would be a good first step. And one that the state provides is just not enough to make up for this uh, catastrophic situation that uh, just con continues to progress. So the Rent Guidelines Board has created and perpetuates uh, the system and we need uh, vacancy decontrol. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you. What we have a question. In, in setting your supplement, your supplement request of nine hundred dollars, do you have rents under nine? What what created the nine hundred dollar threshold? Oh, uh, I'd probably have um, uh, four or five uh, multi generation apartments, and all under nine hundred dollars. In fact, most of them are probably around six seven hundred dollars, and um, it's just. Um, I just think it's way unfair. And do you have a sense what does it cost you to operate an apartment that, that you know, has I, a rent I really of never, six or seven hundred dollars? You know, I don't have a sense. You know, I does mean, does it cost more to operate the apartment? Oh, than clearly, $700? clearly, costs a lot more. I think we have one yeah. more question. I'm sorry. Could, could you just tell us more about the building? Like, uh, I'm not sure if you did, but uh, how, how many total units? Um, there are 28 units in uh, this one building. And, and how many are rent regulated, controlled, or subsidized? Uh, 16. So I, I was, you know, I don't feel bad that I was able to decontrol some apartments. I, I think, uh, thank heavens for that. Uh, to be honest with you, so I don't feel any remorse. Oh, like decontrolled some apartments. Um, and, and, and do you apply for MCIs when you do work in the building? Sure, certainly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.